Hey guys, it's John Bovard, and welcome to the first episode of The Financial Incline, where I'll sit down with business owners and athletes as they share how they've been able to win with their money. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Eric Wood. Eric grew up on the west side of Cincinnati, attended Elder High School and the University of Louisville, and was drafted in the first round of the NFL Draft by the Buffalo Bills. Eric spent nearly nine seasons with the Buffalo Bills, and during his time was nominated twice for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Since transitioning from football, Eric has launched his own media company, he's a broadcaster, he has his own podcast, and owns a fitness facility in Louisville. Eric is a husband, a father, and a great man of faith. I've known Eric since my freshman year of high school, and I'm thrilled to share this conversation with you. I hope you enjoy. All right, so Eric, I appreciate you sitting down with me today. Yeah, my pleasure, dude. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. So I've got to tell my one of my favorite Eric Wood stories, <laughs> and it was a, a, a personal story. Um, so I was, I was a freshman in high school, and Eric was a senior. And, you know, I, I'm – going into a big school, going into the elder high school and the 130 pound freshman. And I'm, I'm, of course I'm nervous. And, um, we crossed paths before during that summer at a couple open gyms, uh, with elder. And, um, so I, you know, I vaguely knew you and we, we just so happened to land in the same study hall class with coach Shira. Yep. And I walk in and you can, you can sit wherever you want. So I walk in and you know, I'm kind of looking around, looking lost and, and Wood Dog, you said to me, hey, Johnny, sit right here. Pull up a seat right next to you. Um, and that, just that alone, because, you know, you got, got you, who's on the state championship football team and, you know, one of the biggest guys in the school. And I thought that was, that was awesome. And we sat together in that study hall. You helped me with my math homework and just truly shows you know, how, how genuine you are. So, Well, I appreciate that. I was scared with what you might come out with there. So that was that was a lot better than uh, some of the alternative stories you could have shared. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But uh, but yeah. So you know, obviously, I wanted to sit down with you and, and you know talk finances and and you know this is a um, you know show about money. So um, if you could just you know relay what was your what was your earliest memory of money? Man, that's a great question. So. Um, you know, I grew up on the west side of Cincinnati, kind of like you, a blue collar town. And, you know, I think, I think when you're raised in a blue collar household where both parents work early on, you get an appreciation for money. I, I think I was probably in sixth or seventh grade when I got to the point where it was like at Christmas time, I wasn't asking for a bunch of stuff because I understood finances at that point. I started working construction for my uncle when I was 14 and started earning a paycheck then. And I've had a number of jobs, but even through high school, I, I was, I don't want to say fully financially independent because I'm living under my parents' roof, but I had a full-time job when I was 16 working at the cemetery cutting grass and I was able to pay my own car insurance. And I always enjoyed um, trying to earn money. And I always felt like I was fairly financially savvy in that way. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's, that's obviously difficult with, you know, playing two sports, um, you know, at, at the high school level and summer workouts and, and doing all that. So that, that's awesome that you were able to make that a priority. Um, so yeah, then, then kind of fast forward to, you know, like you said, working those jobs and, you know, making $8 an hour or whatever it might have been at that time. I to, wish. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> to now you jump in and you, and you get your, your first NFL contract. So what was kind of, you know, going through your mind and, you know, how, how did you go about you know, kind of managing your money at that point? Yeah, and, and even through college, I, I had a number of different jobs, whether it was bar backing or working security at a bar. On Sundays, I would work at a freight company and I would check people in and out and uh, just these truck drivers because this freight company was closed. They would hire a security guard. I would just sit there all day and check people in and out and I would try and save all my homework for that 12 hour period. And I would think like, I'm going to do all my papers, presentations, everything during that one 12 hour period where I'm just stuck there. 
And, um, and so I, I continue to work. And, and like I said, I've always kind of considered myself fairly financially savvy to where even through college where you're managing a scholarship check and still trying to pay bills and all that. Um, so I had a pretty good understanding, but different than maybe baseball and some other sports or a normal career path. When you get to the NFL, you go from literally nothing in college where you're eating peanut butter and jellies for dinner to a, to a fat paycheck. Mm -hmm. And I think because of that, two things can happen. One, you can either blow the money and, and think you have way more than you do, or you don't quite understand how much money you have and you have this fear of spending it all or going broke. And I was more of the second there. I probably didn't realize how much money I was stepping into when I continued to have an apartment, my um, rookie year in the NFL. And mm -hmm. I went to McCluskey Chevrolet in Cincinnati and they gave me a deal on a loaner Tahoe um, that, that or a dealer Tahoe yeah. that the GM had been driving around for a while. And I don't think I fully understood how much money I had, which probably was a good thing because I saved a lot. And I mean, one of the themes of my life is I truly feel like I'm one of just the luckiest people you've ever met in your life, the way everything is shut out and like, but I got into the market in April of 09. So literally <laughs> right when the uptick started right. is when I was able to put my signing bonus into an investment account, mm -hmm. which led to the, the best 10 year stretch investment wise in history. Right. And so um, I truly got lucky because of that. And mm -hmm. if I would have left a year early, my, my money literally would have been cut in half in 08. And right. so um, really fortunate time to step into the market. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was uh, you, you've seen nothing but a bull market for the most uh, for most of your investing career, which is awesome. So, and and while you're playing, I know that it can be you know a little bit a little bit lumpy. So you're you're paid during the season, you get your your paychecks then, uh, which the majority of the time is just in the fall, and you may get you know workout bonuses or roster bonuses, signing bonuses um, throughout the year, but most of the time. You know, you're kind of storing up all of your money and then, you know, living off of that maybe in the off season. So was there any, whether that be a percentage or a certain budget that you stuck to um, either, on, either on a monthly basis or how did you kind of manage that, that, you know, kind of that bumpy cash flow? Yeah, since I got into the NFL, I've worked with the same CPA who's literally done everything for me from a financial perspective, whether that was uh, looking at different investment opportunities to putting, um, us on a budget to tracking all spending. And, and like I mentioned before, I wasn't much of a spender when I got in the NFL, just cause I, I don't think I truly understood how much money I had. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we would track spending and then build budgets off of that for following years. And every month I would call it a scouting report, but I would get a breakdown of everything that was spent, how all my investment accounts did and all that. And then I would get a report with it because sometimes I wouldn't quite understand. And there's sometimes that um, Larry, my CPA will say, Hey, take Leslie out for a nice dinner because you're not spending any money. And then there's other times where he'd say, Hey, I just want to put it on your radar. You know, I know you have to travel in nice clothes, but you spent 10 grand on custom clothes in the past eight months. Mm -hmm. Just putting it on your radar. That's, that's over budget. It's not something you can't afford. I just want to make sure you're aware of it. And so he's done a phenomenal job and, and I can't tell you how many guys don't have somebody like a Larry in their life that play pro sports and just have no concept of money. And, and I mentioned earlier that football is a little bit different yep. in baseball. You have this trajectory of minor leagues making 40,000 to a hundred thousand. You might make 150 grand in triple a, then you have to play for a certain amount of time in the big leagues before you even hit arbitration, before you can get one of those monster deals. Well, right. you understand money as a football player. It's you're 20 to 23 years old as a rookie. Here you go. Here's your money. Good yeah, luck. Right. And, and I, I'm just so fortunate that this guy, Larry Judd in, in Louisville, Kentucky has been that guy for me to kind of coach me along the way. Right. That's fantastic. Yeah. And that's, um, and, and that's good. I mean, you, you definitely, like you'd mentioned, whether it be your upbringing, but um, it seems like you have, what I would call kind of a healthy dose of paranoia, meaning, you, you know, you're, you're worried and um, you're very conservative with your money, which is good. So 
Uh, yeah, and, and to your point there, as time has gone on, I've definitely become more comfortable spending money. But the fact that I wasn't paid off in a big way with what the market did over time, and and I and I do go back and speak to a number of rookies throughout the NFL um, during their first year, and what I tell all of them, I was like, man, you'll never regret saving, but you might regret spending. And I'll tell them, you know, like the rookies that got to see me in my final year with the Bills. My wife drove a Range Rover. I had a nice truck. We owned a house in Buffalo. We had a nice house in Louisville. We had we had a bunch of things, you know, every now and then we'd fly private back and forth to Buffalo. But I would tell them, I said, I'm on my third contract. Right. We did none of that on my first contract. On my second contract, we started to spend a little bit more. But I said, on my third contract, we truly were financially set. And I knew what we could spend up to a year without ever touching what we had invested and all that. And then I'm not talking, you know, I know that my salary was not going to be forever and we knew that too. And so, um, but I would tell them, I said, don't think that I've always done this because I haven't. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember, um, I remember it was, it was years back. And and one of the things that that you said that, that stuck to me is, you know, you, you would always do a great job of not spending your money on material things. And mm-hmm. you actually told us that when we were on a, a trip to Cabo for Rudy's wedding, it was, yep. you know, if you're going to splurge on something, it's a, it's an experience. Yeah. You know, it's something that those memories you'll have for the rest of your life, which, um, you know, I, I thought that that was, that was great. And that's, that's still stuck with me to this day. Yeah. I would always say experience and convenience. You know, I've <laughs> cut a lot of grass in my life and, you know, it's probably just not worth my time right now to cut the grass. I have a good buddy who owns a landscaping company. I get to support him. Right. But um, so that's not necessarily a good use of my time. We get our house cleaned and, you know, because I want my wife not necessarily to have to be scrubbing baseboards. I would rather her be pouring into the kids or doing something that's fulfilling for her. And so I like to spend money on convenience and then experiences and what I would always say, and my wife's probably sick of this, and I would always say, babe, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And she'd say, how is you going on a golf trip a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity? Because I said, I'll never be 27 and going to Pebble Beach again. Like, that's a fact. It's a once-in-a-lifetime. She'll say, like, you can go back to Pebble Beach. But I'm like, but I won't be 27. I may not have this group of buddies. You know, it is what it is. And, and I use that as an example. We've, done, we've used that excuse uh, on ourselves before, too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's great. So, um, one of the things in, in that has come up and obviously, you know, just from watching you through your career, I know you had some, some injuries, you know, your, your leg injuries that, that guys oftentimes they don't even come back from those. Um, so during any of those years, uh, was, you know, or you're in the, in the doctor's office and you, you, know, you, you realize, you could be out for a while. Um, what kind of financial concerns popped up for you at that time? Or what, what was you know, going through your mind financially then? Well, I had a big one my rookie year. I Our bye week was in week 11, week 10 We go, our, was our bye week. I knew I wanted to live in Louisville, Kentucky, because I wanted to continue to train with the college guys in Louisville in the off season. So I literally closed on a house on a Friday and that Sunday I do the Joe Theismann leg break in -hmm. Jacksonville. I'm in the hospital bed in Jacksonville on Monday. My mom, my stepdad, and my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, are sitting there as I'm showing them pictures on a laptop of a house I just bought in Louisville that has no furniture. I have no real possessions at that time besides the clothes in my closet in Buffalo. And I'm showing them, you know, 4,000 square foot house that I bought in Louisville, nothing extravagant, but I literally have nothing. And now I have my legs broken in half and I'm non weight bearing for 12 weeks. And, and who knows if I'm even going to play again, if I'm going to be the shell of the player. And um, so right from then um, obvious concerns about the longevity of my career and I ended up playing for nine years and then um, have a career ending neck injury that I really didn't even know that I had. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of floored me at the time. Uh, but luckiest dude ever, same circumstance before my ninth year in the league, I signed a contract extension and thank God for good agents. They had put a pretty big injury guarantee in there. So my first year out of the NFL, I had the second highest cap hit of any center in the NFL. 
and I was sitting on the couch watching games. So <laughs> right. fortunately that all worked out and, but you know, and financially throughout my career, Buffalo always uh, was willing to reward me for uh, my play on the field. So, um, but yeah, I, I got injured all four years, my first four years in the league, I got yeah. injured and there was financial, you know, concerns at the time. A lot of it was the heaviness of, am I becoming a first round bust because mm. I'm not staying on the field. And then uh, the bills gave me a contract extension heading into year five. And I ended up playing 52 straight games, which was the most for any active center in the NFL at the time. So I did hit a good string there. And then, of course, that streak ends on Monday Night Football. I broke my other leg. Yes, yes, I, I remember that. Um, yeah, that was, that was heartbreaking uh, watching that. So, yeah, so, and you mentioned it. It was probably you know, the, around the time of your, your third contract. But did you ever have a moment or – it could it could be you know a certain dollar amount that you were striving towards or you know like you said kind of just just easing up the reins a little bit but did you have a moment where you realized okay now I'm now I'm financially free you know now I can choose you know when I want to work if I want to work and and it's not really motivated by just money so was there a a point in time kind of in your career where you where you felt that or kind of had that aha moment yeah, and um, I'll only talk about this on here because it's a financial podcast. But when I first got in the NFL, I had this goal of if I can get five million bucks, and if conservatively that can yield five percent a year, I can live off two hundred and fifty grand. And then if I work or do something else, I can supplement that, and we will live a very comfortable lifestyle. Right. Uh, we mentioned a Cabo trip. I was on a Cabo trip before that um, with Kyle Rudolph, our mutual friend, Chad Greenway in Braxton Cave, who uh, played with Kyle at Notre Dame. And Chad Greenway said, dude, the goal isn't five, the goal is 20. And I'm like, $20 million in the bank? He said, yeah, if you can get to 20, then you can truly live a pretty luxurious lifestyle, especially from a West Sider of Cincinnati standpoint. And um, like I said, uh, I'm only talking about this because we're on a financial podcast. But when I when I did get to that, and um, I, that was right around the time of my final contract extension, when I got to 20, I was like, "Yeah, we um, we can live comfortably now, and I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do next in life." And it's funny. The second you think, if you're a, dr a driven person, the, the second you think that the the stay at home dad life's going to be for you you're greatly mistaken. And I lived through that. Uh, that's why I'm now doing a podcast and broadcasting and own a gym and a number of other things. Uh, but at that point I realized I can truly do what I want and not what I have to do. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. And, um, and obviously, you know, the, the goalpost was probably moving throughout your career. You get in a locker room. I'm sure there's, you know, you're, you're running comparisons or you're seeing guys with, you know, X amount of dollars in the bank. And, um, you know, you, that's kind of your new standard. You, you get around yeah. people that, that, you know, are making that kind of money and it, things are, things are a little bit different. And it's all relative. Every stage of life you get to, you always see someone that has something that you don't, that if you're not careful, you can play the comparison game. And that's the biggest robber of joy in our entire world. And unfortunately for us in this generation, we have a comparison machine in our hands at all times that right. you can literally compare yourself to anybody in the world at any time and find something that you don't have. And mm -hmm. that's why I try and keep a perspective at all times of gratitude because I literally have more than I'll ever need. And I even, I talk about this often with my wife, like had I played a lot longer and we ended up with double that amount of money, triple that amount of money in the bank, mm -hmm does it just further complicate things? Does that create another house we have somewhere where it's another headache, which causes us to spend less time with our children or whatever it may be. There's always a new level. And that's where I'm so big on whatever it is for you personally, having some type of daily gratitude practice because comparison's always been a robber of joy, but like our parents will tell you, that was like driving through your own neighborhood was like how you had your comparison. Like, oh, that dude's yard's better than mine. Oh, shoot, one of our neighbors got a new car. I right. can find out tomorrow 
if a teammate that I played with in 2010 got a new car and I could get jealous of that. Right. And that's the world we live in. And that's where you got to be so careful these days. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so yeah, now you're, you're kind of on the other side of things. You've, uh, you know, 2018, um, you know, obviously you got the news of your, of your injury and, um, and now I see that, that you're a business owner. Um, I know you've got the, the gym in Louisville. So what has, um, what, have, what have you liked about that? And, and what are some things that uh, you haven't really enjoyed? Yeah, so um, I, I own the gym, uh, gym in Louisville. It's a, it's a facility, it's an 18,000 square foot facility with turf and a weight room and a rehab facility. Um, we have an area in front that we rent some space. We had a cryo, company that COVID is now crushed, unfortunately, because mm -hmm. um, they, it's amazing that when you're not considered a, you know, like a medical entity, what they allow you to bring in and all that. So that, that crushed them. But um, it's, it's a really cool space. It's been really rewarding to see some of the, especially baseball players that have come out of there. You know, we had a top 10 draft pick out of high school last year who had trained with us and interned with us. He was essentially like a trained like a college athlete through his end point of high school because he was eating at our facility, training there every day. And it's been really cool to make a bunch of relationships. The gym business is hard, especially when you have that much space right. and you have 30 foot ceilings, which are awesome and it looks great, but it's just a lot of rent. And, you know, you learn a lot of lessons in any type of business venture you do. And, you know, I had Larry Judd, uh, who I mentioned earlier, look at that on the front end. He said, look, the amount of money you're putting in, this isn't make or break. If it's a passion play for you, do it. And so, um, you know, the gym's doing well now. It's, it's amazing how things work. As COVID has shut down high school weight rooms, we then pick up a bunch of team contracts, which makes us have a better year than we've ever had. Yep. And it's just kind of funny. The gym business is getting crushed, but I think it's going to be a lot of that middle market, the LA fitness, the urban actives. I think those probably go by the wayside and your right. plan of fitnesses your really cheap ones that you forget about will stay. And then your lifetime fitnesses, your boutique gyms will, will stay as well. But, um, and luckily we're kind of in that, I say upper echelon. It's right. It, we're just kind of a, more of a niche market. Um, yeah. but I say all that I've learned a lot. Um, you know, you sit in enough meetings, you, you look at enough P and L sheets and all that you, you learn things. And there's obviously things we wish as a company we would have done differently. Luckily I got, partnered up with some people who are a lot smarter than me in all of this. So they've got us in a good direction, but now I have, I mean, I guess I own a media company since I have a podcast and I put my broadcasting stuff through this LLC and all that. Um, so there's been challenges and a lot of stuff I've learned through that as well. And it's a lot of experimenting. I mean, I, at 32, I got thrust into the, I'll call it the real world. And for me, it's a lot of trying things out, see what I truly like to do. Um, and, and, and I, man, I've, I've made some investments that COVID has not been friendly to. And, you know, that's what that, and that'll happen. And, right. and, you know, private equity deals, there's a place in a portfolio for them. And you could probably speak 10 times better than this than I could. But, you know, when they're, when a startup chance to hit a home run is one in 30, you got to treat it like that. You Absolutely. Know, there's a place for it. And if it's a passion play for you, and you have the financial means for it, have some fun with it, but right. do not ever let that compromise or potentially compromise your lifestyle if you're comfortable where you're at. And that's yeah. where we are. It's like, I would rather not ever risk our current lifestyle to try and obtain the next level mm -hmm. of money, of luxury, of travel, whatever it may be, because yeah. I don't ever want to risk this. Right, right. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And, and I always advise people that, it's kind of your wealth allocation framework. You've got your essential assets that you're living off of, and then you've got a different bucket way over here, your aspirational assets where, you know, and, and that's long-term, that's a little bit more risky, but it, you know, if that does well, maybe it's a, you know, an extra trip every year mm -hmm. or, you know, a lake house or whatever that might be, but you're not, you're not risking those, you know, essential assets to make sure you're taken care of. So sure. are there, um, when you're looking at investments, I mean, obviously now you know, you, you've got your normal, you know, your stocks and bonds that are in the, in the public market, but is there anything in particular that you look at or industries that you like um, to invest in from a, a private market perspective? 
Yeah. And uh, first, even, even on kind of a different side of this, I've been advised recently, and this was a good one. I was finding myself just kind of helping out some buddies or I'd be approached and it'd be a small amount of money and I would just do it because, Oh, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And, and honestly, if I lose the money, write it off, it's a loss and kind of right. cancels itself out, but it all involves time. So mm -hmm. where I would advise people don't do too many small investments. Cause you think like, Oh, well, it's not that big of a deal, but it's going to take a lot of your time, no matter what it is. If you own part of it, it's, emails, it's board meetings, it's calls, it's updates, it's time. And so just be careful on that end. You know, anything with technology now, if, if something doesn't involve technology or data, then it almost seems archaic at this point. And, you know, you, you, you got to question kind of the growth of it. Um, right. For us in Kentucky, I mean, bourbon's one of the hottest commodities in the world. I did a, an investment a couple of years ago. Um, I'm still hoping it hits, but it combines technology, data, and bourbon. And so that was, and as, as Larry looked at it, he said, look, this combines two really hot things. The people running it are well, but, but anything, and I would love to hear you confirm this, but anything you do, any investment, whoever's running it is who you're investing in because it, it doesn't matter how good a product is. If the right people aren't running it, it's not going to go anywhere. Right, right. You're exactly right. And, and that's what, like you mentioned, to the time uh, perspective, you don't, if the right people aren't running it, you're going to find yourself spending a lot more time either trying to fix things or time talking to your wife about it or right. <laughs> things like that, that, yeah, if you don't have the right people in place, it could, it could really start to get ugly for you. And you know, what, what seemed like fun at first and, and, and a cool investment idea you know, can, can turn into a nightmare. So for sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, I agree. There's a lot, a lot coming out and um, I'd be surprised. I, I did hear recently that you've, it looks like, are you invested in some, some horses down there in, in Louisville or uh, what? Yes, yeah, so I just there? joined, just joined a horse partnership. And how about this for an investment? Um, we just claimed a horse on Saturday for, it was a, $60,000 claimer. So we had to spend another 10% to the trainer. He gets a fee on that. So it was 66 grand, our foursome was out. The next day we were offered 95 grand for him and we're waiting on the counter. Hopefully this doesn't come out before the horse sells, but uh, we're waiting on the counter, but $30,000 in one day. I never thought when I was cutting grass at the cemetery, I'd be flipping horses like this, but, <laughs> and, and, and this, so this is fun for me. Uh, right. My kids love going out to the track, go to the backside, visit the horses. They're gorgeous. It's, it's awesome. It's something fun to do here in Louisville. Um, but when you get really smart people that understand the game, mm -hmm. you can stretch your money out a long, over a long period of time where we're not necessarily going to go buy a derby horse and buy its breeding rights and play that deep seven, eight figure game. Right. You can make some pretty good money playing the game this way too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. That's a, that's a whole new world. Um, that, that's great. So, so you've got, like you mentioned, you're podcasting, you're broadcasting and you're a keynote speaker. So what, what sort of motivated you to you know, start to pursue those careers? You know, honestly, I was so taken off guard when my career ended because I just had signed a contract extension. I was the only player on the team to play 100% of the snaps that year. So I was so caught off guard. It was like, okay, and, and I'm a man of faith. So I was like, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me here? Like, is this the platform? Are you giving me a platform, a story now to share with others? And so for me, um, with the broadcasting, being around sports, I was not ready to not be around football anymore. And so for me, coaching is way too much time. Um, to me, the thing that turns me off on getting into coaching, and I would love to coach ball at a high level, college or pro level. To me, it's not how efficient you can be at the facility each day. It's just how much time can you spend there. And if I'm working 5 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, 11 months a year, I'm not going to be able to be the husband and dad I want to be. I can't have the impact on them that I want in – I respect so much the guys that do. And, and my life was so impacted by coaches all throughout from 
high school, college, the NFL, that I'm so appreciative that there's guys that make that sacrifice. And look, you impact so many people. I just don't feel like at this point in my life, that's going to cut it for me. So how do you be around ball if you can't play anymore and you can't coach? You talk about it. So that's where I'm at in broadcasting. It's been a fun challenge. Um, I find myself at times extremely humbled by some of the roles I play and all that, but I'm learning a ton. I've met phenomenal people and, and I've had some fun with it. Um, the podcasting, I wasn't really sure where I was heading. I had no broadcasting gigs yet and I needed to create some content. And so I met with a guy in Louisville and I started a podcast and I've, I've just been able to be connected in a non sleazy, a non what can I have from you type of way, but I've just been connected to just so many amazing people. And the art of the conversation has been lost. Like this, our, our, our generation, I'll say, you know, we, we text instead of call, we zoom instead of meet in person. And I know this is because of COVID, but we're just losing the art of the conversation. And I'll have a guy on my podcast that I've known for 10 years. I get to control the conversation for maybe one hour, I'll learn more about him in one hour than I did in those 10 previous years combined. And it's just been phenomenal to learn from people. Um, and, um, and then with the keynote speaking, I don't necessarily go actively seek out gigs, but some of the gigs that I've been hired on have been um, humbling. It makes me prepare. I've learned from all of them. By forcing myself to prepare something, I inevitably learn a ton throughout the process. And I just feel like God's blessed me in so many incredible ways. Um, I've, I've had a lot of life lessons that I feel like I can share. And through the amount of adversity I've been able to get through, especially in 2020, I can speak into um, uh, overcoming adversity and a number of other things. I mentioned I talked to rookies about saving money. I, I could kind of talk on a number of different things, but in 2020, a lot of people are facing adversity that's out of their control. That's nothing that they caused for the first time in their life. And I've been there. Let me help you. I'm, I'm, I'm three years ahead of you. So uh, let, me, let me share some of my lessons. Right. That's great. Yeah, that, that's awesome. And, and the other thing you have is the, the Eric Wood Foundation, um, which, it, which is phenomenal as well. And um, so what are some of the, the organizations and, and the causes that you're passionate about? Yeah, so the Eric Wood Foundation has actually become the Eric Wood Fund under Oshai Children's Hospital in Buffalo. And the reason it's become that is because, and this, this was before I even, uh, my career ended, I didn't love the fact that we were paying admin costs and all that. Mm -hmm. it, it literally hurt me to my core that when I stood up at a charity event and said, please donate your money, that I knew that not every dollar was going into those families' hands. And because of the structure, I couldn't even cover the cost of it because that would be more money coming in than I get a cut of that. It, it just didn't work out. It was never gonna be flush. And so I met with this hospital in Buffalo that was treating all the families with sick kids that, that were treating all the sick children and housing all the families that we were dealing with anyways. And so I said, hey, how do we make this work that all the money benefits your patients and their families, but you guys got to cover the costs? And they said, right. that, that actually works out perfectly for us. We have people on staff that can manage this. It would literally just be um, another item on their list. Like we have the personnel in place already to, to handle that. So um, I formed a great relationship with this hospital up in Buffalo. We've been able to do some incredible things. Um, I mean, even through COVID, we were able to find um, a hotel to partner up with us. So all the families that normally would come in and stay at the Ronald McDonald House, well, they could no longer stay there. Mm -hmm. And then the families that had children at the hospital, there was only allowed one person at a time in the hospital. But a lot of these people travel in from anywhere in the state of New York to get treated here. And so what do the families do? And they can't afford hotel rooms. So we partnered up with a hotel. There's no... There's not a ton of uh, travel to Buffalo anyways, outside of maybe Bill's games. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but there's really no travel with COVID going on. Right. And so we partnered up with a hotel. It was great for the hotel. They got to put some people in the rooms. They gave us a discounted rate and we were able to house a ton of families through COVID. So it's been special to get to know 
um, families, get to know some of these kids. Um, and then we, we have a suite for Bill's games. We do a Christmas program and all that. So that's been a ton of fun. Yeah, that's phenomenal. That, that's, that, that's awesome. And, and one thing here that we'll, we'll kind of end on today. So I, you know, I, I've heard you mention before that you know, your, your faith is your foundation and, and, you know, obviously you know, we, we both went to Catholic schools and, um, you know, religion's always been a part of our lives and, and now it's, you know, you are, you're more and more outspoken about it, which, which is great to see. Um, a lot of people need God, especially throughout this year and, and throughout this time as, as kind of that rock and that foundation. So what, what led to you, you know, wanting to be you know, a little bit more outspoken about your faith and um, you know, sharing that with others? Yeah. I mean, honestly, because of, um, the impact that having a relationship with Christ has had on my life, I want, I want to tell people about it. And I think for a lot of my life, I had kind of an imposter syndrome thinking, man, I'm not perfect. I don't have it all figured out. Who am I to tell someone else about, um, having a relationship with Jesus Christ? Like, who am I? Yeah. Well, you get over that when you realize there was only one perfect person and I am a Christian because I need a relationship with God. Right. Like I need that. I don't, I'm never going to be perfect. I hope no one puts their faith and trust in Eric Wood because I will let you down. And so will all human beings. Right. We're not perfect, but I can point you to someone who is. So when, once I finally got to, once I finally got over, like just because I got baptized and just because um, I put Bible verses out there, doesn't mean that I have to feel like I have to be perfect all the time. And if I'm not, I'm some type of imposter we're all going to fall short in life. And just coming to grips with that has made me a lot more outspoken because if someone says, Hey dude, I saw you drinking a beer at that ball game. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you said you're a Christian. I'd say you're exactly right. You know, and, and I, I do all types of stuff that would disappoint you, but if you open up the Bible, you'll read about someone who, who, who will give you some hope. That's right. And who Jesus was hanging out with. He wasn't, he wasn't hanging out with, with perfect people either. So exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Eric, keep up the good work. I know you've got to jump. I greatly appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day to, to hop on here and, and wish you all the best. And um, I'll, I'll put out links to you know, your, your website and podcast and, and hopefully, you know, here's to your continued success and appreciate the time today. Yeah, likewise. It was absolutely my pleasure. It was great to connect and, and good luck with everything you got going on, brother. All right. Thanks, Eric. If you like what you see today, make sure to hit the subscribe button. I'll be releasing more videos like this in the future.